Thank you, and uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us. With me today, I have our CFO, Frodo Jacobson, and, our, and uh, Song Lin, who today now holds the role of co-CEO of Opera. Before I hand over the call to Frodo, I would like to remind everyone that in the conference call today, the company will be making statements about its future results and expectations, which constitute forward-looking statements within the meaning of the Private Securities Litigation and Reform Act. Such statements are based on current expectations and the current economic environment and are inherently subject to economic, competitive, and other uncertainties and contingencies beyond the control of management. You should be cautioned that these statements are not a guarantee of future performance. You may refer to the safe harbor statements in the company's earnings release for details. Our commentary today will also include non-IFRS financial measures, including adjusted EBITDA, which are different from our consolidated financial statements that are prepared and presented based on IFRS. We believe that the use of our non-IFRS financial measures provides an additional tool for investors to use in evaluating ongoing operating results and trends. These measures should not be considered in isolation or as a substitute for financial information prepared in accordance with IFRS. With that, let me now turn over the call to our CFO, Frodo Jacobson. Thanks, Eric, and hello, everyone. We have a lot of exciting stuff to cover today. Two big announcements, which I'll address first, and later I'll cover our financial highlights and provide some color on how our business is recovering from COVID-19 and returning to growth. Let's cover the first piece of news, namely the elevation of Sung Lin from his role as Chief Operating Officer to his new role as Co-CEO stepping in alongside Yahui Zhou, who remains both CEO and Chairman of Opera. This promotion formalizes the wrong role Song Lin has been executing on for the past years, basically overseeing everything at Opera outside of the micro-lending business, and highlights the trust that Yahui places in him and in the global Opera leadership team. As context, Sung Lin joined Opera in Norway 18 years ago and spent many years in key engineering roles. Later on, he was instrumental in our privatization and transition to new ownership and our strategy to accelerate our trajectory and leverage our, our user base to launch new businesses. As many of you have realized in live face-to-face -face discussions, Sung Lin knows everything there is to know about Opera and the markets where we operate. He's a fast talker and a quick thinker with good intuition. And just like Yahui, he has a tremendous drive and urgency, and together the two of them have shaped our company and our ambitions over the past years. On a personal level, he is also a fantastic guy to work with, and I know I speak for all of our staff when I congratulate him on his expanded role. Now to the second topic, the formation of Nanobank. As many of you know, we have been working towards massive fintech opportunities for several years. First, we incubated Opay, now Nigeria's largest mobile wallet company, both in transactions and value. It has become a leader in its space and again doubled its transaction volumes over the past six months. We structured Opay as its own company from day one, as we wanted to raise external capital to address the massive potential of building out such an offering across Africa without impacting Opera's strong balance sheet. Opay has raised $170 million to date, and investor demand to take part in that journey has been very strong. Separately, we have scaled our micro-lending offerings from practically nothing to a massive business in just over a year. It has continually exceeded our expectations with exponential growth and strong profitability, and is a great example of how Opera utilizes its platform and significant user base as a competitive advantage. Last year, which was really the first year of operations, the business provided approximately 15 million loans representing over $800 million in value, and built a user base with tens of millions of registered users. With that background, 
we are excited to be announcing NanoBank, which is the combination of Opera's microlending business and the equivalent business of our closest partner in this space, MobiMagic, which works with us in India and has a large growing microlending business in Indonesia. When operating together, these businesses will form a significant power in the fintech space for emerging markets. By creating NanoBank, we are setting the stage for continued growth, consolidating profitability and cash generation, diversification on both the product side and in terms of geographies, and finally, we are providing this business with the flexibility to operate as its own company. The resulting NanoBank will be one of the biggest global fintech companies focused on emerging markets and a category leader. NanoBank will single-mindedly focus on increasing its leading position in the emerging markets fintech space. Combined, the business will also benefit from shared technologies, data aggregation, and central functions such as risk management and credit scoring through user profiling and KYC efforts. Shared operational know-how and a more holistic view and adaptation to regulation. Further, NanoBank will have significant strategic flexibility for the future to come, such as taking in strategic investors or floating shares. We are very proud of the business we have built over such a short time frame, including an efficient organization with strong operations and well-managed business practices. For Opera and our shareholders, this transaction highlights the value we've created. It simplifies our investment story, provides us with additional flexibility, and it creates a corporate framework that best supports the business as it continues to scale as a category leader over the next several years. Now, let's get into the details on MobiMagic, the combined companies, and the transaction. MobiMagic launched microlending operations in mid-2018 with the goal to be one of the largest fintech providers in Southeast Asia. Its initial market was Indonesia. Then MobiMagic supported our launch and scale in India as our technology and business partner, leading to results well in excess of our most optimistic forecasts. In 2019, MobiMagic generated 106 million of revenue for a highly profitable business that had $48 million in pre-tax profits. MobiMagic shared a similar growth curve to Opera's microlending efforts as Indonesia scaled throughout 2019 and as they participated in the exponential growth we saw in India. In the same period, Opera generated $128 million in fintech revenue and a pre-tax profit of approximately $19 million in this business area. The combined Opera and MobiMagic businesses perform our results when adjusting for transactions between the companies, generated revenues of approximately $209 million and a pre-tax profit of approximately $68 million in 2019, as well as provided almost 20 million loans with an aggregate value well over $1 billion. To provide some additional context on the scale and rapid growth of this business, prior to the significant impact from COVID-19, the combined businesses generated a combined $120 million in revenue in the first quarter of 2020 alone, on 10 million loans dispersed with a total value of 686 million. This compares to a combined revenue of 22 million on less than 100 million in loans dispersed in the first quarter of 2019. Further, NanoBank as a whole generated profits in the first half 2020, despite significant extraordinary credit loss provisions related to COVID-19. On that point, the recovery from COVID-19 is well underway. The NanoBank businesses have been increasing loans provided in all key markets, India, Indonesia, and Kenya, since the end of June. Loans dispersed were 44 million in July compared to 28 million in June. This ramp has continued into August, most notably in Indonesia, that is already nearing pre-COVID levels. While higher credit standards have been employed in the near term to ensure profitable loans, 
Nanobank expects to continue to rescale volumes as it gains additional confidence. While it still remains difficult to predict when this business will return to early Q1 levels, it is clear that Nanobank is on that path. Looking ahead, we have massive growth expectations for Nanobank to grow far beyond pre-COVID-19 levels. First, India is a huge market, and to date, Nanobank has only interacted with roughly 3% of the population, or 18% of the unbanked. Second, Nanobank has just begun geographical expansion. Today, we can also announce the launch of another major market prepared in collaboration between Opera and Moby Magic, namely Mexico, which has a substantial unbanked population. And as we look ahead, we expect Nanobank will launch several new countries to further increase its total addressable market. Finally, Nanobank will continue to develop and deploy fintech offerings beyond microlending. This includes marketplace offers, buy now, pay later products, mobile payment and debit cards, some of which are now live and others that will be launched over the next year. Over time, we really believe that the potential to broaden the offering is substantial, building Nanobank's large registered base of 50 million plus users and enabling increased recurring engagement with our products. The transaction itself and Opera's interests in particular have been overseen and closely reviewed by Opera's audit committee of independent directors, as Moby Magic was controlled by our CEO. Further, Opera engaged an independent professional third party to value the respective nanobank contributions and to help determine the ownership split. The factors that determine the agreed ownership split were the forecasted cash flows, multiples of most relevant public companies, and provided working capital, such as cash and loan book of each party. The cash that was part of Opera's microlending business as consolidated by Opera in our June 30th balance sheet was 31 million and our loan book was 14 million. As part of our contribution to Nanobank, the net cash in the business and the loan book will also transition to Nanobank. This resulted in an agreed ownership split of 42% Opera 58% Moby Magic in this otherwise non-cash transaction. So, looping back to the combined Proforma results, if Nanobank had been effective Jan 1, 2019, Opera's 42% share of pre-tax profits would have been approximately 28 million in 2019, compared to the approximate 19 million that our standalone business generated. From a reporting standpoint, we plan to be transparent and discuss the performance of Nanobank in our quarterly results, as it will be a key factor in our overall sum of the parts valuation. We expect to provide details such as revenue, profits, and key operating metrics on a quarterly basis, and we will make it easy to see what our revenue and adjusted EBITDA would be when including our 42% fair share of nanobank revenue and adjusted EBITDA. In terms of IFRS reporting, Opera's share of the nanobank results will be reflected in the share of net income of associates and joint ventures line in our income statement. Additionally, Opera will report a sizable one-time gain as a result of this transaction currently estimated at over $100 million. This follows the recognition of our initial nanobank ownership at fair value, representing a step up versus the book values of Opera's contributed business. Further, we will conduct a PPA on the difference between fair and book value of nanobank as a whole, and Opera will recognize amortization cost as appropriate over the coming years as it relates to excess values allocated to intangible assets, such as technology, customer relationships, and licenses. To sum up, we are really excited about Nanobank and expect it will demonstrate a highly attractive trajectory going forward as it continues to scale and expand into new geographies and products, with the potential to be multiples bigger and generate hundreds of millions in profits. This 
along with OPRA's other growth initiatives, which Sung Min will speak about, are key elements in our effort to drive strong returns for OPRA before covering Q2 results and recent trends. Hey guys, thank you, Judah. So, um, you know, I'm glad to be named as co CEO. And, you know, I view it as not myself, but really a realization of what the overall Opera team has accomplished over the past few years, growing revenues, users, and scaling multiple new businesses. So, thank you, guys. It's an exciting 18 year journey. Um, you know, I look forward to taking on this new role and continuing the strong momentum together with the proud Opera team. So, you know, at the time, I'll talk about some recent trends and developments. Uh, very unusual times for this Q2, yet historical high user growth become a keyword. Our user base in the Q2 was a record 363 million monthly active users, an increase of 12 million users compared to Q1. This was driven by growth in Africa and Europe, our key regions of focus. Our base has started growth in July, reaching an overtime high of 379 million monthly active users despite summer seasonality. So we are very pleased about that. Um, and if we further break it down, um, Opera News has achieved an important milestone in May of around 200 million monthly active users and average 205 million users in Q2. It's up 26% year over year. We are also proud that Opera News has become a critical information hub during the COVID-19 outbreak. On the other angle, our browser users also continue to grow our PC users have grown 15% year over year to a record of 75 million in Q2. This was driven by both the strengths we've seen in Europe with our PC offering, which is becoming ever more relevant when people spend more time from the home base. And also globally, from Opera GX, the world's first gaming browser, which has reached 4 million monthly active users recently and more than doubled year to date. On the mobile, um, we are also seeing strong results in Africa due to our product relevance and also our increasing technical relationships. We are very happy to announce the corporations with leading telecoms in the region, namely MTN and also recently Safaricom, to, to have services in several countries in Africa. These partnerships have provided for strong future user growth. Our focus is to continue our growth trajectory and, and in July, for 12 million mobile browser users versus June. So I'm um, very excited here. Um, now also getting to, um, we are seeing a clear recovery trend from the low point in April with each month showing improved year over year trends. So now, we continue to be bullish on our long-term monetization with the offline to online transition, accelerating, signaled by continued growth of OLIS with its 6 million monthly active users compared to a little over 4 million at the start of the year. We are also very excited about our launch of Opera for Business in partnership with Google, which we just announced last week. It will be a um, perfect base to enhance monetization in the region. And you know, even though short-term monetization has been slowed by COVID-19, the digital advertising ecosystem in Africa represents very attractive long-term growth. Let me also zoom in a bit on Opera News, for instance. That product has grown revenues 65% year over year 
in spite of the monetization impact of COVID, it has actually reached top five in Google's programmatic inventory worldwide. There are, of course, still many rating-related inefficiencies for programmatic inventory in Africa, simply because it has not reached enough attention from global players. But what we are working on is solving those problems every day with all our partners, because given our scale and also the quality of that product, we believe the monetization potential can be huge. And you know, finally, we are also extremely excited about our new European FinTech initiative, which we think has the potential to be very big and also accelerate our growth in 2021 and beyond. We have some real competitive advantages with more than 50 million addressable users in the region that make online transactions and purchases through our browsers, which in fact is the point of sale you know, that us would have. That gives us a huge potential to kickstart innovative financial services. You know, we have been testing our digital wallet in our first major EU market, Spain, and have already acquired our first users. Initially, our offerings will be monetized through a buy now pay later product, which will generate revenue through transaction commissions and credit fees. This product, while having similarities with current buy now pay later, uh, PL players, such as Klarna or Afterpay, will be unique as it will focus on the users versus the merchant. So essentially, a user should be able to make purchases with any merchant like they would normally do in a browser and then retrospectively decide how to pay for them. So we expect to formally launch later this year and also to take additional steps in the near term of our offering. We have built up a great fintech business in emerging markets in the last two years, and now as a company deeply rooted and headquartered in Europe, with also recent added strengths from our Pocasys acquisition and recently Fiat Bank, we are very excited about the potential and also opportunity that we see in Europe. This will be the focus of the team for next few months, and we really look forward to updating you as we scale this new business. So just to conclude, Opera has a lot going for us. First, we are growing and have record high users. Second, we are diligently focused on increasing monetization. And third, we have exciting new initiatives that leverage our existing at scale asset and will drive additional revenue and earnings growth in the years to come. So with that, let me hand back the talk to further about our Q2 financials results in detail. Thanks, Hanglin. Given the extraordinary nature of the second quarter, I'm going to keep our comments short as the results aren't reflective of our business and focus on key highlights and trends. Additionally, additionally I would advise you to look at our press release for more detailed information. Revenue for the second quarter was 55.4 million. Of this, search was 17.6 million, down 18% year over year. Trends improved each month of the quarter. PC has recovered quicker, whereas the mobile recovery is taking a little longer based on exposure to emerging markets. However, both platforms are on the way to recovery, and in July, search revenue had regained half of the year-over-year -year decline observed in Q2. Advertising was 12.7 million, down 22% year-over-year. Advertising revenue also improved each month of the quarter, and we benefited from strong e-commerce partners and sports leagues returning. In July, advertising revenue had regained two-thirds of the year-over-year -year decline observed in Q2, and was back to year-over-year -year growth when excluding the travel vertical. FinTech revenue was 11.8 million, and as discussed, loan volumes began ramping in late June. Finally, combined retail and tech revenues were 13.3 million, 
As a reminder, we expect combined retail and tech revenues to be between 5 and 6 million next quarter, though that reduction is not expected to affect profits. Our operating expenses were 59.4 million, down considerably from the first quarter due to two primary factors. One, discipline around variable costs, and two, lower credit losses in microlending due to the smaller revenue base and stronger than expected collections on loans that were open at the end of Q1. As a result, adjusted EBITDA was positive at $2.9 million in the quarter. Net income was $17.1 million, benefiting from finance income from marketable securities, the performance of our investees, and other income from our divestment of a Nigerian subsidiary. Our operating cash flow was positive at $7 million for the quarter, where the biggest components were microloan collections adding to our cash and cash outflow related to costs of prior periods with greater fintech volume. The reason our total cash and marketable securities still fell by $55 million in the quarter was that we repaid 48 million of loans, largely in-market credit facilities, and repurchased $13 million of our own shares. Everything else more or less nets out. In terms of our share buyback program, at the end of Q2, we had repurchased 2.47 million ADSs year to date for a total spend of 18.5 million. Including repurchases in this quarter, we have repurchased 3.46 million ADSs for a total spend of 28 million, averaging 808 per ADS and leaving 22 million of additional repurchases under our announced 50 million buyback program. Now, looking forward, the good news is that the year over year trends in our business have improved each month since bottoming in April. While we are hesitant to give specific revenue guidance for the third quarter due to continued uncertainty around COVID-19, we think it's helpful to share several directional data points. First, combined search and advertising were down 8% year over year in July, recovering from the 19% year over year decline we saw for Q2 and we've seen further improvement in August month to date. We expect a sequential revenue increase from Q2 to Q3 in our combined search and advertising business to materially exceed the 6% increase we had in the same period last year, as our business continues to recover and user metrics remain strong. Further, we expect to see a similar benefit from Q3 to Q4. Second, as discussed earlier, retail and tech revenue will be roughly 5 to 6 million combined. This will be almost an $8 million headwind on third quarter revenue versus this past quarter, but will not impact profitability as both businesses are low margin. Three, our new initiatives, OList and European FinTech, will start to generate revenue in second half this year though we expect the contribution to be small, and our focus here is to prepare for significant contribution to our growth as we look into 2021 and beyond. Finally, we are expecting a meaningful improvement in EBITDA margin in the third quarter, primarily top line driven, given the high margin of search and advertising revenue. To wrap up, Our core search and advertising business is recovering from COVID-19, and we believe is positioned to return to its historical growth rates in 2021. Our new initiatives are progressing well, and we expect them to support further acceleration of our growth rates next year. Finally, we believe our investments in OPE, StarMaker, and now NanoBank will drive value creation for opera shareholders as these businesses continue to execute. We are very excited about the future and returning to our strong growth trajectory. With that, I think we can now move to questions. Thank you. As a reminder to ask a question, please press star one on your telephone keypad. 
To withdraw your question, press the pound key. We do ask that you please pick up your handset to allow optimal sound quality. Our first question comes from the line of Lee Kroll of B. Riley FBR. Great. Thanks for taking my questions, and congrats, Song, on the uh, promotion to co-CEO. Um, I wanted to start out on the, um, the search and advertising business. Um, you kind of consolidated the trends of those business into down 8% year over year. Could you maybe break out uh, the trends specifically by search and advertising quarter to date? And then I guess the other breakout I was curious on is just by the subsectors, um, which have returned to kind of normalized levels and which are lagging. Thanks. Uh, yes, sure. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for the question. So, uh, yeah, as mentioned, in, in Q2, search was down 18% year over year and advertising 21%. Um, in, in July, we, we saw that search had uh, regained half and was down 9% year over year. Uh, advertising, even more so, uh, was down 6% year over year. And as I mentioned, uh, excluding travel, it was uh, it was back to growth year over year in July. And Got hey, it. this is Derek. The, the other comment that we made is that you know month to date in August we're seeing you know better trends than July. Got it. Okay. Um, and then on, on the nanobank transaction, um, you guys provided a lot of detail that was helpful. I just kind of wanted to dig in on, on the question of why now. Um, you know, the business has reached some decent scale, um, a lot of velocity, but obviously a brief pause with the pandemic. Uh, why does it make sense to do this tr transaction today versus waiting for it to build further scale uh, within Opera? Thanks. Sure. Uh, I mean, this, this is something that we have considered for some time. Uh, we've seen fantastic operational performance in both Opera and Mobi Magic. Uh, we think this is good timing to consolidate now and prepare in, uh, for, for the re-acceleration of the business and do everything we can so that that business is set up to be a true leader at a global scale for emerging markets. We see operational benefits, uh, as mentioned. Uh, we also see structural flexibility over time. Got it. Thank you for taking my questions. Sure. Our next question comes from the line of Lance Vitanza of Cowan. Hi, guys. Uh, thanks for, uh, for taking the questions and glad to hear things are, are improving. Um, let me actually ask you a couple questions on, on NanoBank. I guess the first is, um, how easy or difficult do you expect the integration with Moby Magic and the formation of the JV to be? And are there risks there that you know putting the two companies together causes you to to miss some of the opportunities in the marketplace over the next say three to six months? Uh, sure, uh, Frodo here again, I'll answer that question. Um, I, I would say at the starting point, operationally, the businesses have different uh, core markets. Where it overlaps, we already work together. Uh, so that would actually simplify things, uh, being part, having it as part of one joint group. I think we've also seen that in Mexico, which we are really excited about that market uh, we have prepared together, uh, and uh, we are about to really start scaling, scaling that now. I think uh, in terms of build, uh, building a corporate function, that is an area where Opera will remain quite involved, very similar to how we, we supported OPE in its early days until we have sort of the corporate consolidating function uh, well in place. Okay, and then um, sticking with, with this, this, so you know, obviously you talked about the disparate um, profitability, right? So 
Opera generating more than half of the revenue, but at a relatively low margin versus Moby Magic generating less than half of the revenue, but at a, a pretty impressive margin. How do you explain that margin differential? Is that sustainable? What are the structural elements that go into that? And, and I guess, you know, I know you mentioned all of the factors, but at the end of the day, is, is that margin differential really why, you know, why Opera winds up with only 42% of the equity in the JV despite contributing the majority of the revenue? Um, yeah, so I would say on profitability, first of all, there there will always be country by country differences in terms of how profitable each market will be. And Moby Magic has set up a very attractive business in Indonesia, both in terms of growth and profitability. Uh, second reason why their profitability is good is that they've been able to leverage their technology uh, developed for Indonesia as they have supported Opera in India, uh, which has made it, uh, made, it uh, made the company profitable as you as you referred to. So and I, I so, and going to, to, to cover the second yeah. part of the question. So so when we've when we have looked at the relative valuations, we have uh, looked at cash flows uh, over a long time periods, uh, and we have looked at multiples, uh, both on, on revenue and profit level, to sort of determine the right split. Uh, on that one, as I mentioned, we, we engaged an independent uh, professional party uh, to, to help us uh, confirm the appropriateness. Off this and Lance, Lance, this is Derek. We're not expecting any structural changes in terms of, you know, Moby Magic's business, meaning their tech platform will be the same and, and Indonesia, you know, you know, will continue to do what it's doing. So there's nothing that's, um, you know, one time this year. Thank you. That was really, that was a big part of the question. And then I guess just, you know, and I think you went through this on the prepared remarks, but just to make sure I have it right. So there was roughly 31 million. If I take your June 30 cash and marketable securities of about 160, and then I back out the 31 million or so that you are shipping into the joint venture essentially. So on a pro forma basis, you've got about 130 million of cash and marketable securities. Is that, is that accurate? Correct. Okay, uh, and then just uh, any, will there be any debt at the JV? I would imagine, you know, nothing on balance sheet, but could you, you know, anything about the debt structure there? And then also, um, and I apologize, I'm not familiar with uh, the, the, the Moby Magic shareholder base. I know that there's a relationship there um, between your, uh, your, your other co-CEO and chairman, but could you remind me um, his percentage ownership in, in Moby Magic and, and how that, uh, whether that's direct or indirect through the uh, through one of his other investment vehicles. Sure. Um, uh, so to answer the first question, uh, no, there won't be any uh, external debt uh, in the in the nano bank uh, in the nano bank balance sheet. So that will be clear. On ownership, it is correct uh, that our CEO uh, ha is the majority. Shareholder in in Moby Magic. Okay, thank you very much, guys. Appreciate the appreciate the help. Sure, thank you. Our next question comes from one of John Gotten of Lake Street. Hey guys, thank you for taking my question. Uh, congrats. Uh, first uh, on the Nano Bay, can you talk? a little bit more detail really of how you think this expands the TAM, uh, both from a geographic and scalability standpoint, as well as from a new product standpoint. And then number two, um, can you walk me through, you know, kind of the, the strategy for customer acquisition, especially uh, for some of these markets where Opera hasn't had a significant presence um, through any other products previously? Thank you. Uh, sure, uh, I'll, I'll, I can go first. So we believe that a consolidated company uh, working across different geographies uh, makes, makes the operation solid, makes it easier to expand to new geographies. It also supports a broader product diversification. 
to essentially have a company that has centralized tech that it, it can apply in different geographies. So we believe that the combination of Opera and Moby Magic into NanoBank uh, is very supportive for its continued uh, growth. Yeah, and this is Derek. The, the, I, I would add, yeah. when you look at the existing markets, or I guess the new markets of Indonesia and Mexico, um, they're two of the top unbanked markets. You know, obviously they're smaller than India, uh, but bigger in size than Kenya, so they're, they're bigger opportunities. I mean, I think Mexico has the opportunity to be very similar to Indonesia in, in terms of uh, scale. You know, there's some other markets that Nanobank is looking at, and um, you know, which again would fall into, you know, large unbanked populations, and you know they want to a make sure everything with this deal goes right. B get Mexico uh, continuing to scale and India scale back up, but you know in the next six to twelve months would not be shocked to see a couple big more markets. The other thing that I think we spoke a little about. Uh, last quarter of the quarter before with the expanded products. So they are working on that. Um, there's multiple different products. Um, you know, remember, when you look at Nanobank, there were 50 million registered users. And when you look at the loans the companies provided, they're not giving a lot of users. So they're really focused on how do they get the most out of that registered user base. Um, and go from there. I think your what was your final question was around how do they acquire users in, in different countries? Yeah, just you know the customer acquisition strategy in, in countries where you know Opera hasn't previously had a big uh, presence. Yeah, I mean in yeah, general, like like uh, you know guys in Sony Hill. Uh, yeah, like you know, sorry for jumping. I guess I'm I'm a bit jealous that Fruta get all the questions, so I, I just want to try to chime in. Um, uh, yeah, so like uh, maybe also to comment a bit, right? So so like it's a bit related, maybe a bit repetitive. Is that you know we actually feel that now is a great time to do this. You know, like uh, you know, you know, first of all, micro learning business is doing great, um, but then of course it does have impact. Uh, you know, with COVID, but now of course the region has been recovering, so we actually feel that you know now it's a great time. You know, uh, partly because the demand is more than ever. Um, you know, also because that you talk about customer acquisition, because now you know obviously for well, Opera is big, like uh, India, Indonesia, or even Mexico. Uh, we, are, we are reasonably big, uh, but then now is also a fantastic time to actually acquire users because the cost is very cheap because people are still recovering from COVID. So, like, you know, it's a fantastic time for you to get uh, user probably at the cheapest level, um, you know, possible. So we really feel that now is our chance actually to, to scale. Um, you know, without being too exciting, we feel that in, in those emerging markets, uh, we really have um, the golden chance to actually be, I would say, you know, maybe I'll be too bold to say number one, right? So, you know, reasonably short time frame. But then we need to concentrate. We need to, you know, have one team to focus on that, you know, streamline all the risk control, all the QIC, and all the processes. So, so I think that, uh, you know, now it's golden timing. But, you know, maybe partly to answer your question that, now is also a completely perfect time to acquire users because, you know, in all those markets we talk about uh, South Asia, Southeast Asia, or even Latin America, um, you know, it's the best time to acquire user as it is very cost effective now, uh, also in combination with opera traffic. Uh, that's super helpful. Thank you. And then the second one. Again. Yep. Thank you, Sean. And second one also for you. Um, could you just talk a little bit? in more detail about the trends you're seeing with the Opera News Hub um, and kind of the progress you're making there with the expansion into, uh, I believe you're in six markets now, uh, as well as um, how OList is trending and whether that's kind of you know ahead um, or in line with your expectations maybe at the beginning of the year. Thank you. Um, yeah, so it's, it's a bit sporadic, um, so I, I'm not sure if I hear you clearly, but I'll try to answer what I hear. Um, so, you know, high level, as, as we also commented a bit, um, you know, on the, uh, on the, on the press release, uh, Opera News are growing really well uh, in Q2. Um, you know, it's a milestone that it actually passed 200 million, and, uh, you know, now the average is also passed 205 million in the second quarter, so it's a good indication that, that uh, you know, we believe our strategy really works. 
And and yes, you are right that you know by actually use the Open News Hub, we are able to establish a very strong presence by you know uh, work with all the local content producers in all those key countries, you know Nigeria, Kenya, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, and a few others. Um, and and that of course really powered um, the the growth that we are seeing. Um, and I just have to say that of course we are quite pleased of the role we have been playing. Um, in uh, you know during COVID time, it's because apparently that actually becoming a, a you know good uh, go-to place for people to actually check all those relevant news. So so you know, all fair comment that you know you probably see that in our financial report, we we actually have uh, you know reduced our marketing spend just because the organic growth of users are so big that uh, we almost don't need to spend that much, but then we still have uh, you know 26 year over year growth on that. So we are very pleased about it. Um, and and also, uh, I'm not sure if I hear you clearly, but if you are talking about monetization, um, I also commented a bit that, uh, you know, despite of the COVID uh, news, monetization in Q2 has almost, uh, you know, growth by 65% compared with last year. Uh, so, you know, obviously it's still at a low point last year, but still um, 65% during COVID. I think it's a very strong signal that, that we're doing well. And as also commented that, you know, if you look at how many app impressions we are solving uh, globally, uh, news is actually almost, uh, you know, top, top five ones if you look at programmatic live from Google. Um, so we are very proud. Uh, like, again, I guess the only issue is that the ECPM in general in Africa obviously is still very low compared with what you see in, say, uh, U.S. or Europe. Um, but we just have confidence that, uh, you know, when the COVID recover, and when that whole region becomes to grow, we will be in a very good position to, uh, to grow further. So, so we're quite pleased with what we have been done with MILS in, in Africa. Thank you, yes. Our next question comes from Alana Alicia Yap of Citigroup. Um, hi. Um, good evening, management. This is Vicky Wei on behalf of Alicia Yap. So I've got two questions. The first one is about advertising. So as the COVID-19 situation becomes better and we expect traffic and ad budget gradually to normalize in the second quarter. So can you elaborate a bit more on the trend you see in July and August? I mean, overall advertiser budget sentiment and for rest of the year. And have you seen any cautiousness on ad budget spending in line with geographic political tension? And also by categories, let's say um, online travel, e-commerce, would you please explain more about how advertisers performance? Thank you. Yeah, Fruta, do you, uh, like, I, I guess I can take it. Uh, this is only for a high level, and then Fruta can probably comment a bit on the, um, you know, on the action numbers. Like, again, it's just because Fruta has taken many relevant questions that I'm, I'm helping out here. Um, so, yeah, so I would say, uh, like, like what Fruta has already been saying, that I would say, uh, in, you know, in, in July, August, we, we have already seen a great recovery, which we are, you know, op optimistic about. You know, if we try to segregate a bit, I would say on the mobile, um, I think the ad revenue are, you know, are growing nicely, uh, almost back to where it is, you know, before. So, so like, we are very hopeful that this trend will continue. Of course, we have to be cautious because there are some uncertainties. But, but you know, high level, we see that uh, at least in well, we are big. It's, it's recovering and it's very, you know, it's positive. Um, on the desktop side, I would say, uh, you know, search is already, as Fruta said, as you know, has almost, uh, you know, recovery into the, uh, you know, only single digit drop compared with, uh, you know, last year. And then hopefully that trend will continue. Um, so, 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 which is great. In terms of, um, you know, advertisement, uh, I would say, you know, um, if you look at categories uh, without traveling, um, you know, which, you know, primarily remains is, is uh, you know, e-commerce and a few others, I would say those are already back to the last year level, maybe slightly higher. Um, so, so in terms of traveling, of course, it's still a bit impacted, um, but uh, we also see strong recoveries, uh, a few times recovery, say, from June to July, and then that trend also continues in August. Um, so, you know, uh, remain to be seen. We, we believe, of course, it will, it will still be down compared with last year, but, you know, the growth trend is very encouraging. Um, so, so I think that's more likely to be high level. Uh, but then further can also comment a bit on the details on numbers. 
Yeah, I think we'll be we'll be quite careful in sort of laying out the trajectory of sort of the normalization and back to growth. Uh, maybe the only thing I can add as a reminder is at the beginning of the year, we uh, we guided advertising to grow faster in 2020 than in 2019. Last year it grew 18, and and uh, start of the year we were also well over 20% in year-over-year -year growth. Um, since then, uh, of course, we have COVID, which has uh, impacted monetization these days, but we also have more users than what we expected to have at this point in time. Uh, so, so I believe uh, the, the outlook is actually quite positive when it comes to advertising and search monetization. Um, thank you. I have one follow-up question about the European fintech business. So we know that the company is taking a lot of initiatives. I want to ask management's opinion in the longer term, with let's say in two to three years, how do you see your market position? And would you please share with us any um, long-term and short-term plan? Thank you. Yeah, this is Derek. I mean, um, yeah. in, in terms of our market position, I think the idea is continue doing what we've been doing, which is growing our users, um, you know, COVID aside, growing our monetization, and then using our platform to launch new products. You know, so obviously we've been successful over the last couple of years with Opera News, as well as, um, you know, the micro lending. And I think, you know, when you look at OList, when you look at the European FinTech and some other initiatives that uh, are too early to talk about, our hope is is that you know we grow our search and advertising at historical or better rate, and then we find new businesses to turbocharge growth. So that's um, sort of how we look at it. Thank you. Our next question comes from Ron of Li Peng Xiao of CICC. Hi, management. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, I'm wondering whether you could provide updates on OLIFT business, um, such as MAU and uh, our monetization method on the business, and also our uh, uh, like uh, growth strategy. Thank you. Um, yeah, so yeah, this is Johnny Hill. Um I, I, I can just give a quick remark. So yes, so so all this is what we launched in Nigeria. Um it's a very good example of how we're trying to enable the local merchants to, you know, um transit from the offline business to the online business. Um, you know, user wise we have in Q two rates average about six million monthly active users compared with four million in the start of the year, which we are quite proud because that's a user base, you know, that's a big user base, um, you know, country like Nigeria. Um, you know, monetization-wise, I think it's also a very good example that we, we have just announced the initiative of, uh, you know, of offer for business together with Google. I think that's a, that's a very, um, that's illustrated actually our strategy that we will try to partner with all the bigger guys like Google and potentially other players in the region to help those merchants and potentially uh, end users, you know, better monetize and also do the better transitions. Um, so, like, like I, I guess you are welcome to actually go to our website or Ultra for Business, and there will be a bit more um, interesting updates. And uh, and we feel that in we are optimistic about how that can power the uh, you know the uh, the transition uh, into a digital ad space, which actually is, is ever more relevant uh, in the current COVID situations because it's tougher and tougher for digital ads to do it from purely online. So I think we're just very proud uh, we are we are there. Um, you know, moving forward, I think our strategy will be the same, that we will try to, you know, build similar propositions in Africa and even potentially in other parts of the world, which is our core regime, because I think, we think all of these are relevant to helping uh, transition from offline to online. Okay, thank you. And that was our final question. I'd like to turn the floor back over to Song Lin for any additional or closing remarks. Sure. So uh, yeah. So so if there's no uh, no further questions, I think I would just say that you know, guys, I'm very proud of how Opera has continued to execute 
among the uncertain times. The good news is that our use of the app monetization is bouncing back. We have very exciting new initiatives that could really turbocharge our growth, and we are positioned to take advantage of the you know, structure change uh, from transition of you know, uh, offline to online. Um, so like, looking forward to taking the great opportunity um, you know, together with all of you. And thanks, everyone, for joining us today, and uh, have a good day.